Welcome to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. I'm your host, certified religious transition and trauma recovery coach, Terry Hales. I help people step out of the shadows of religious fear and shame and embrace their authentic selves with love and empathy. If you're ready to throw off the shackles of learned binary thinking and explore a more nuanced approach to life, this is your playground. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. Today we have a really exciting guest and um, a really exciting topic. For the whole month of February, we're going to be talking about issues with relationships. And today we're going to be talking about a conflict cycle, a negative conflict cycle. Do we even want to call it that? A negative conflict cycle? Well, it's a negative cycle, but but it's there's also positive cycles, which we'll, we'll cover as well. Get into. Yep. Yeah. So I'm so excited to introduce to you uh, my first guest of the show. And Kevin Hales is a licensed professional counselor who primarily works with marriage and family relationships. He's been practicing for eight years. Before that, he was active duty, active duty, active duty military. Um, And he was an Air Force reservist for six years. So he was active duty military for nine and an Air Force reservist for six years. I also happen to be lucky enough to call him my husband, and I've been here for his entire professional journey. Well, maybe I missed a couple of college classes, but aside from that, I've been here for all of it. Um, We met at Brigham Young University, where he promptly persuaded me to take a marriage preparation class, and I loved it so much, I changed my major and began studying about human development and relationships right along with him. So we actually started off our marriage with a super glamorous job working as janitors in a building on BYU campus called The Marb. And as we would scrub toilets and do all of that, we would talk about our classwork and the things that we were learning in class. We also had some of our first marriage conflict amongst those bathroom stalls and worked through a lot of that well before the sun came up at like four in the morning. But yeah, I I think he's one of the best therapists I know. I know a lot of therapists. He's one of my very favorite. And I say that without bias, actually, like uh, whether we were married or not, I would recommend him to anyone. But I feel really lucky that he's in our house and that we have we continue to have the same conversations we had during our janitorial work uh, with one another here in our house. And now we're having those conversations with our kids as well. So I'm sure at some point we'll be talking about parenting and talking about these kinds of topics with kids. Um, but today we're going to talk about adult relationships in particular. Um, so yeah, welcome to the show. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So today we're going to talk about, um, conflict cycles and we're going to talk about the patterns that we get into and I'm going to kind of turn this over to Kevin and, and just introduce the topic. Um, this is something he deals with in his practice because all of us have these conflict cycles. Even he and I, we have these conflict cycles and uh, we're going to talk about them. Yep. Yeah. No, it's, uh, I guess that's the uh, the important thing maybe to address first is the idea that um, we have these cycles of conflict in every relationship, mm-hmm. right? It's, 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 uh, uh, any person that we have a relationship with that we care for, we're going to have some sort of a cycle with them. So yours and my cycle, you know, uh, is going to be different than maybe the cycles we have with our kids or develop with our kids over time. So, yeah, it's just it's it's an important element to be aware of so that we can then start to address it. Right. Mm-hmm. It, isn't there some sort of saying that up is recognizing there's a problem and then you can fix it or start to fix it or something like that. Yeah. I always say awareness is the first step to solving a problem. Yeah. 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 You can't solve a problem that you can't see. Right. So um, th- there's a book by Sue Johnson, Susan Johnson, uh, called Hold Me Tight. And 
Um, she's, uh, I would say one of the initial figures in the professional field that kind of helped identify this cycle, um, which was pretty, pretty groundbreaking. If mm-hmm. you think about it, just because, uh, up until that point, we didn't know that or have that awareness, or at least didn't have the ability to put that into words and, and, and be able to illustrate that. And so, and that's so important being able to put these things into words, because when we don't have language for something mm-hmm. as humans, when we don't have language for an experience, it's hard to, um, it's hard to evaluate it. It's hard to, to think consciously about it. We need to wrap those words around it for us to even like bring it into reality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we're, we're, th- there's a, there's an actual diagram of the cycle that we're going to be uh, looking at and kind of walking through uh, in this podcast. Um, and I believe you're going to be posting a link mm-hmm. for that, right? Yeah. I'm going to post a link to uh, Kevin's website um, where you can look at, you can look at this uh, diagram that we're going to be talking about today. So you can get a better understanding of the cycle and what it looks like as we go through the different parts of it. But also it's the best, it's the best way to contact him. If you're listening to this and you're like, I want to talk to him or to someone he works with, um, about therapy, but you're out of luck if you want to follow him on social media, cause he doesn't do that. So <laughs> you'll have to just catch glimpses of him on my social media and our kids. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've tried the social media thing in the past and it's doesn't always go over so well. So, <clears throat> yeah. So it's funny. Cause I forgot to, I forgot to talk about that. I was like, you know, this is where you can follow him. And I was like, wait, you can't follow him anywhere. Really? I mean, <laughs> except my web, you know, the, my website. Yeah. So. Your website is, is the extent of it. Yeah. Occasionally I'll put, you know, blogs on there. And so you can read some of my blogs that I've written in the past. Yeah, so. you do. You blog. I forgot mm-hmm. about that. Yeah. yeah. He blogs and they're really good. All right. So yeah, Hold Me Tight was a really good book. I remember when you recommended that I read that. Mm -hmm. Um, And it explains so much about attachment theory and how we relate with one another um, as, you know, as as humans and what we're craving from one another, what our conflict actually means, um, why we get into these cycles. It just took took away a lot of the shame for me about just the normal human experience of relating with another human. So, yeah. 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 Well, and, and I think that's part of the purpose is to illustrate that conflict is not bad. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, I think that's what, you know, especially the audience that you're talking to most, if not all of us listening to this have grown up with religion and, um, and at least in Mormonism, uh, you know, uh, there's a scripture specifically in third Nephi eleven twenty nine that says contention is of the devil. And of course there's probably been plenty of talks and, uh, you know, sermons and, 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 you know, things that we've heard throughout our lives growing up, even if we're not super religious that seem to illustrate, seem to communicate to us that conflict, arguing, fighting, it's all bad. Mm -hmm. Um, part of what tells us that is of course our, our emotions, right? I mean, I would, I would argue most of us don't necessarily enjoy fighting and being in conflict with each other because it does fill up, bring up those, those feelings of defensiveness. And, and it's just, you know, I don't want to argue with people I love. I don't want to be in conflict and then add on top of that, the shame that we tend to feel the shame that we feel because of what we say and do in those, those highly emotional moments. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, so often we have been taught not just that conflict is bad, but even just the feelings of frustration or anger or disappointment or loneliness or any of those other emotions that we might be feeling in conflict, um, that feeling of being misunderstood or not seen, um, we might feel shame just about even feeling those things. Mm-hmm. And I, what I think is interesting is I think when we say the word conflict, what comes up for me is what we often see in the movies, the really dramatic conflict, the really big fights. And, you know, those can happen in real life marriages, but conflict isn't always this big explosive thing. Um, and sometimes conflict 
even in unhealthy relationships, looks like one person always getting their way and the other person like swallowing themselves or like suppressing who they are or what they want or what they feel. And that doesn't feel good for the person that's constantly suppressing. And I would imagine it doesn't feel good for the person that's always getting their way too. It probably feels like it feels disconnected, I would imagine. And that is like a like a low simmer uh, conflict. And all of that is conflict. It just, uh, I, I think most of us, when we think of conflict, we think of big explosive bursts of anger. And, and we're talking about all human interaction that isn't, you know, that, that has that friction between it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny you bring up Hollywood and movies because that is a very common, uh, technique, I guess you could say that is used for dramatic flair Mm -hmm. is, I mean, you see this almost every time there's an argument or fight in a movie, uh, somebody kind of gets in this zinger they, 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 they say or do something for this dramatic effect. And then almost every time they'll like turn around and storm out of the room, you know, and the other person, you know, the camera zooms in on their face and they're just kind of jaw drop, you know, don't have a response. And, and, and that's, <laughs> it's so unhealthy in, in so many different ways because, because that's not the point of conflict to win. Mm-hmm. And, and then that's what these cycles often kind of devolve down into is this, this feeling of who's right and who's wrong, who's the winner, who's the loser, you know, whose fault is it, who's, whose fault is it not? And, and that if we're arguing about those things, we're, we're typically way off in left field and, and we're nowhere near where we should be. Yeah. And at that point, too, we're like bringing up things from 10 years ago and we're right. talking about your mother mm-hmm. and we're, you know, talking about the dirty underwear you left on the ground. And um, we're bringing up all these things that have nothing to do with the conflict in the moment right. um, as a way to prove that we're we're better or we're right or, you know, right. you're at fault. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's it's well. And, and, and so I guess maybe one of the things to point out here, which which is conflict is normal. Conflict is actually healthy. That's, that's not a message you're going to ever hear at church usually, right? The, the idea that conflict is somehow healthy or necessary is often feels very counterintuitive because that's not, again, what we've been taught or learned growing up. So the, do you want to quote me? I do. I love to quote him. <laughs> he has he has this quote that he says. He said it one time while we were on the couch, and I quote him forevermore. Um, he says, conflict is the natural byproduct of a loving relationship. And that was one of those jaw drop moments for me where I was like, hold that thought. I'm going to write that down. And so um, I wrote it down, and I, I quote him all the time because so many of us, that's a limiting belief that's left over from religion is that conflict is um, unhealthy and that it is Satan when actually it builds trust. When we can talk through conflict and we can understand one another, it actually builds closeness. It builds trust. Um, it's uncomfortable for a moment, but it, it makes our relationship so much more comfortable in the long run. Yeah, it's I, I think I sometimes liken it to growing pains. Right. You know, that there is no such thing as a relationship, you know, that's happily ever after, like a lot of us learned from Disney movies growing up. There is no such thing as a relationship or a, 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 uh, a, 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 uh, uh, what's the, what's the phrase? Like a, not, not a chosen one, but like your, your soulmate. A soulmate. Thank you. Right. There is no such thing as a soulmate or somebody who just kind of falls into your lap and boom, you just, you're, you're, you're made for each other. Uh, I believe you can become soulmates and, and that's through hard work and effort and conflict resolution and, and so forth. But for that to just happen, no, no, there, there is no such thing. Um, and, and, and so that, that requires us to meet these conflictual moments with courage and to show up and to be emotionally mature about the whole thing. Now that's a, that's a tall order because we live in a, an emotionally unhealthy and toxic uh, world. And so emotional maturity and courage are our key ingredients uh, in, in order to work through the conflict. So going back, I guess, to that idea of growing pains, uh, you know, when we work out, for example, we experience pain 
in our, in our muscles. And that is because the muscles, the fibers of our muscles are literally being torn apart. And yes, that hurts their soreness. But of course, anyone who, who continues to work out and to be consistent in their working out knows that those muscles will grow and they become stronger and your endurance grows. And, and most of us probably enjoy the, the outcomes of working out and looking better and feeling better, but you can't do that without the growing pains. And yeah. so it's, it's very similar to a relationship. These are normal growing steps in a relationship uh, that, that we have to be able to meet. But again, really hard for us to do when we've been taught most of our lives that it's bad or yeah. evil or just uncomfortable. Yeah. We'll avoid it at all cost if we believe that it's evil or that it's bad or that it's hurting our relationship in some way. So knowing that conflict is normal, it's not bad. It's a part of, uh, you know, a, any healthy relationship, a loving relationship Let's, uh, let's, let's maybe lay a couple of ground rules, mm -hmm. um, uh, that, that, that I, that I try to basically establish with, with my clients when I work with my couples. And, and, and again, some of these, uh, sometimes are hard to accept or are hard to, uh, put into practice. You know, maybe, maybe we can accept it in the moment, but, uh, you know, putting that into practice, of course, is always going to be harder, but I think probably the most important one that we have to establish is that when it comes to conflict, generally speaking, I try not to deal in absolutes anymore, you know, now that I'm not in, you know, religion anymore, but generally speaking, there is no right and wrong when it comes to working through conflict. Would you agree? Yeah, I would absolutely agree. And that's really where we get stuck so often is trying mm -hmm. to prove we're right. Mm -hmm. um, and the other person's trying to prove they're right. And so often both of us are right when you understand where we're coming from. Well, and, and, yeah, and it's it, and again, it's not even so much about right and wrong, it, it, unless we're talking about you know rightness in a in a in a uh, purpose, mm -hmm. uh, which I guess leads to the next ground rule, which is basically that perspective is reality, right? A lot of us have probably heard that phrase before. Perspective is reality. In other words how I perceive something, how, how I'm feeling about something. It's real. I'm not making it up. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, BS. It's not, you know, a fantasy or something in my head. Right. And, 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 and again, sometimes, sometimes that's hard to wrap our head around because we are often gaslighted. We are often made to feel that we are wrong or that we're crazy or that we're imagining something or that that's, you know, or that's my perspective, but it's wrong, you mm -hmm. know, because that's not the real truth, you know? And so, so the, the idea that there's, there's no right and wrong and that, you know, our perspectives are our realities. Um, sometimes that's, that's, you know, we can kind of grasp that concept, but again, it's, it's often harder to put that into, to practice, particularly when we're in the middle of one of these cycles and, and emotions are escalated. Yeah, because, I mean, when we're in anger, we get into fire or flight mode or mm -hmm. freeze mode. Mm -hmm. That can happen. Um, and we're often telling our kids that when we're angry, our, our blood rushes from our brains into our limbs. Mm -hmm. um, we get into our reptilian brain and we're thinking about survival, which is why we either want to run away from the other person or the withdrawer, right? We want to run away or we're the pursuer and we want to fight. Mm -hmm. um, and we, and we may not even want to fight. We want to discuss, right? We want to discuss and get through this. So when we're angry or frustrated, it makes so much sense that it would be harder to cognitively think about these things. But when we have these ground rules ahead of time, it's easier to stay in that place of, oh yeah, no, there's no right or wrong. And that the way I'm seeing it is just the way I'm seeing it, that I'm looking at life through my lens, through my perspective, through my, you know, past experiences and how those have gone. Um, and I'm drawing conclusions that might not necessarily be, you know, factual or they they might not be what was intended at all. Or at least just not entirely accurate. Right. right. Maybe there's some truth to it. Maybe there's some some elements that are correct or, you know, quote unquote, right. But 
but maybe I'm not seeing the whole picture. Right? right. It's, I mean, it reminds me of that. Isn't it like an Indian proverb or something, but the, these three blind men, you know, uh, are, are touching different parts of an elephant. Yeah. And, and one of them is, you know, describing the leg and it's, well, what does an elephant look like? And remember these men are blind, so they can't see the whole thing. But one of them is touching the leg. He says, well, an elephant is round and it's thick and it's, you know, kind of hairy. And he, you know, he's describing his perspective. Another one has the elephant's ear and he says, no, actually the elephant is, you know, is round and kind of floppy and it's, you know, kind of wide. And, and then the other one is maybe messing with the trunk. And he says, no, actually it's, it's kind of long and thin and, and it bends and it, you know, and there's air coming out of this, this hole here, you know, and th the idea of course is neither of them are completely right or wrong. Right. They both have a different perspective and, 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 and that's what we have to, I guess, keep in mind when we're talking about conflict and, and working through conflict is that we do have our different perspectives and that's why it's, it's pointless and fruitless to argue about who's right and who's wrong. Yeah. Because all of them are talking about the elephant and all of them are right and wrong because they don't have maybe the whole, the whole, uh, picture. they're not taking in the whole picture. Yeah. yeah. So they're right. not taking in the whole picture and yet the part that they're observing from their perspective is, is right. I right. love that the three guys are blind too, yeah. because yeah. so often we're blind to other people's perspectives. Yeah. Um, and, and we think the world works the way we see it when there are a million, a billion, seven billion other ways to look at what's going on in the world. Right. Yeah. Right. But so I guess that idea that per perspective is reality, it's kind of a double edged sword, mm -hmm. right? Because how I'm seeing and experiencing something is real. It's factual for me, but it's hard for us to take a step back and see the forest from the trees. It's mm -hmm. hard to take a step back and go, yes, this is how I'm feeling. This is how I'm seeing it, but maybe it's not the whole picture. Maybe there's something I'm missing. Maybe I don't remember it quite as accurate as I think I do. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that, that's something a lot of us like to pride ourselves on as well. I've got a great memory and I remember exactly what you said to me and what you did. And, 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 and then we can weaponize that, mm -hmm. you know, in the midst of conflict, something we have to realize no matter how good you think your memory is, none of us have a perfect recollection of, of anything that yeah. happens, especially as we get older, that those, those memories and those things we think we know fade with time. And, and we have to keep that in mind because in order to resolve conflict, we have to be able to empathize with each other. We have to be able to put ourselves in the shoes of the other person. We have to be able to, to understand that my memory and my perspective isn't the only one and, and could be flawed, could be skewed, could be um, biased, biased. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, so good to remember. Well, and I love how earlier when we were talking about this, you brought up, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, the mm -hmm. astrophysicist and like his work on individual truth versus objective truth. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you want to share what you were talking about in there. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it kind of goes, I guess, uh, in line with what we're talking about that, that, you know, perspective is reality. Therefore, you know, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, this is my truth, right? Um, my truth, my reality, it, it's true. It's not false. It's not made up. And you know, he, he uses that word objective truth, you know, individual truth, which is, you know, our own perspectives. And then he uses the word, you know, objective truth, which might be, I don't know, the laws of gravity, for example, you, no matter how much you try to deny or, you know, disprove the law of gravity, it's still objectively true. Uh, at the end of the day, things are still going to fall from the sky because of the law of gravity. And so I think that's probably what he's referring to, but we have to be careful with that when it comes to resolving conflict, because sometimes we hear that phrase, you have your truth. I have my truth. And somewhere in the middle is this ultimate objective, objective truth. truth. And, and while that might be true in, in the realm of science, and while that may be technically true in an argument it's, it's really not the ultimate goal to find that ultimate truth because then eventually it feels like one of us has to be wrong. Mm -hmm. There's always a winner and a loser. Right. And, and, and so, so 
th th there's a lot of different approaches to couples therapy. Um, the one I've been trained in is called EFT, emotionally focused therapy. I don't believe that there's one right approach to working through, you know, mental health issues and, and relationship issues, but it definitely is one of, uh, I would say the, the most prominent and effective ones, uh, out there. And one of the things that they talk about, uh, in EFT is, is, is getting lost in the content, getting lost in the content is basically what, what we're discussing here, right? Cause that's where most arguments tend to reside is, is in that area of content, what was said, who said it, when they said it, how they said it. And because we're both arguing from our own perspectives and our own takes on things, it's never going to 100% completely sync up because, because we're seeing it through a lens, mm -hmm. right? And like you said, when we're in that, that cycle, we're typically in a fight or flight or freeze state of mind, which means we are relying wholly on our lizard reptilian brain in that moment, which is all about survival. Mm -hmm. All we're concerned about is survival and the higher functioning parts of the brain are not operating. They are not firing on all cylinders. And so, so we, so, so that's why we, we do see things through a very different lens and experiencing and experience things, uh, and remember them differently because we're both in our, our, our own survival state of mind. Yep. And we're winning feels like a, sometimes like a, a life or death kind of a situation. What do you mean? Well, I mean, so often I feel like uh, whenever you're in conflict and you're in that reptilian brain state of mind, it's it's not just about who's right or wrong. It's about the survival of your ego, I think, is really what it mm, is. Yeah. Um, the survival of your sense of self, the survival of having a voice in the relationship having a a presence being heard because that sense of self-worth and belonging is so important to us as humans, we will fight tooth and nail for it because losing ourselves um, and having to subvert ourselves can feel like a kind of death. I feel like yeah. in some ways. Yeah. Well, and, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, that's, that's what triggers the fight or flight response in us is that feeling of, this being life or death, right? Mm -hmm. So, so the example I sometimes use is if you're walking out into a busy intersection and there's a car that you didn't see initially, and now it's about to hit you, you don't calmly turn and think, oh, wow, this is an interesting situation. I wonder what I should do right now. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, it, it's so silly to, to, to think about it in those terms, because what we're going to do is we're going to immediately leap into action. We're going to fly out of the way of, of, of the car. Or of course, you know, you'll hear and see situations where somebody's standing in front of a car and we jump out and push that person out mm -hmm. of the way. Right. We're not thinking again to ourselves logically, Oh, I should sacrifice, sacrifice myself, uh, you know, on behalf of this other person, especially if it's like our kid, you know, we're obviously not going to think about that uh, in that way. But, but that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's immediately where our mind goes because it is a life and death situation. Mm -hmm. Now, the parallel here, of course, is that because of this topic of belonging and attachment needs, that's what, that's how we experience our most intimate relationships. Mm -hmm. We experience it from that place of life or death. Mm -hmm. And so, so as an example of that, you know, if you're walking down the street and some random stranger says, Hey, you're stupid, you're ugly. Most of us are probably just going to shrug our shoulders and go, all right, buddy, you have a good day, you know, and we're mm -hmm. going to go home and continue with our day. We're probably not going to lose any sleep that night, mm -hmm. you know, but let's say I go home and I walk in the door and the most important person in my life says, I hate you. You're ugly. Suddenly that carries a lot more weight, mm -hmm. right? Suddenly, it feels a lot more like life and death. Exactly. It, th that's how our body's experiencing it, right? When, when we think about it logically, of course, my wife saying, you're stupid, I hate you, you know, uh, isn't necessarily life or death. I'm not, I'm going to survive, you know, you know, what my mom always say to me, sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt you. You know, it's such BS because words do hurt, right? And sometimes long into our adulthood. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And so it's, it's, it's it, what we have to understand, I guess, is, is that our body, our emotions, our amygdala, you know, the brain is experiencing the conflict as a life or death matter 
And that's why we do do, uh, react in some of the ways that we do. Yeah. No, I love that. And I love normalizing that, that this is, I mean, our bodies are trying to protect us. They're trying to keep us safe. But unfortunately, they're also creating distance in our relationships that that makes us feel terrible. Sure. Whenever we follow the cycle. Yeah, Yeah. it's 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 a there's pros and cons to how we react in these situations. Mm -hmm. And, and, And we'll talk about that a little bit as we get into it. But I mean, let's 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 jump into it. For those of you that, you know, have um, followed the link that Terry posted, we'd encourage you to pull up the the, the diagram, which uh, looks like an infinity symbol. Some people might even say... It looks like a female reproductive system to me. <laughs> it looks like, like a pair of ovaries, maybe. Well, there's that heart underneath <laughs> it. And, I, like, and I'm not the only one. He brought that home and I was like, that looks like you know, ovaries and a, a uterus <laughs> that, okay. However you see it. And, and now that we've, you know, described a pair of ovaries, it might be hard to unsee that, but, <laughs> but, but the important thing is this is a, this is a good visual, right? A lot of us are visual learners and it helps to have kind of a visual to, uh, to walk through, you know, as we're talking about this, but where we're going to start is we're going to start uh, right in the middle uh, where it says trigger cue alarm bell. And, and I, and, 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 and this is, this is typically where our cycles are going to start. The, the, the a trigger or a cue, uh, is basically anything that sets us off on this cycle. And so, for example, one of the ways we can figure out we've been triggered is maybe one minute I feel perfectly normal and okay. And then suddenly the next moment I'm feeling kind of angry or I'm feeling kind of defensive or I'm feeling you know, something's changed, right? Mm-hmm. So something almost palpable has changed in the atmosphere. You've always been good about that. You know, if I, if I'm closed off or kind of giving you the cold shoulder, you're, you're almost always going to go, Hey, what's going on? You know, something, are we okay? You know, and, and you're going to keep asking questions to, to figure out because the, the, the energy between us fills, fills yeah. off. That's my empath yeah. kicking in. That's me like reading the emotional energy in the room. Right. Yeah. And so, so a trigger and a cue can be a combination of things, uh, but generally speaking, it tends to be um, you know a, a combination of of the elements of, of of a message. And what I mean by that is when we communicate with people, when we when we talk or write or you know communicate, anytime we communicate, we're sending a message, and a message can be broken up into three different parts. Um, the there's the words that we're saying in the message that consists of 7% of the entire message. So it's a tiny, tiny portion. Uh, the next part is the tone and volume that we say things in, you know, so (laughs) I'll sometimes use the example of if I come to you and say, I love you (laughs) now, now you can't see my face, but just, just listening to that tone you know, what, what does that sound like? It almost sounds like a question. I mean, how does that come across to you? Yeah. It's like, I think I love you. Right. Maybe. So, so are the words, I love you. Nice. Good. Typically. Of course, traditionally. Right. But when I say it like that, maybe not so much. Yeah. Right. And then with that face you just made. Right. Definitely not. Like that was like a disgusted (laughs) face. And, and the face, the, 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 the verbal, uh, you know, nonverbal uh, body language makes up 55% oh, wow. of the message. So that combined with the tone and volume, that makes up 93% of the message. And the words alone are only 7%. Now, we have all had experiences where we have misinterpreted a text yep. or an email. That's why. Because we're reading it in the tone of voice that we would assign to it exactly. instead of the tone of voice that was intended. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Now, 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 in the day and age that we live in, I think it's important to, to, to highlight a lot of people have text arguments with each other. And this is part of why um, these, these do happen because we're lacking the tone and the volume and the body language. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's an important part to keep in mind. Uh, when we're talking about, you know, arguing and fighting is, is it's almost always going to be better to resolve conflict in person, face to face, not via text or email. At the very least over the telephone. Right. Yeah. And obviously if that's not possible, you know, telephone, but of course, you know, video is, is, is as 
you know, accessible as it ever was before yeah. now, nowadays. Yeah. So I have a video call, do FaceTime, um, be able to see people's body language because so often, even without words, people are communicating things with their body language. Exactly. Um, I if, mean, in my coaching sessions all the time, I can see people get uncomfortable, even though they say they're fine or they say, no, I think, I think I'm resolved here. I can see in their body, mm -hmm. they're not comfortable. They're still, and I can ask them about that. Like mm -hmm. you look uncomfortable. Tell me about that. Right. Um, yeah, it, it'd be the same way. Like if you were talking to me and sharing something about yourself or your day and I keep glancing at my watch and I'm going, wow, that's awesome, honey. But I keep glancing at my watch. Mm -hmm. What's the real message? Is right. I don't want to be here. I don't want to listen to you. Right. I'm too busy for you. <laughs> or it might just be, I have someplace to be. I really do want to hear, but I've got sure. an appointment. Well, and, and, and there's a lot of conclusions you could draw from that. And that's part of why we, we have to identify this cycle and be able to walk through it. So going back to that, that trigger cue alarm bell, and part of why we, you, we use the, the, um, the term alarm bell is because the amygdala is a part of the brain that controls that fight or flight life or death response. Mm -hmm. And, and the amygdala, that's actually one of its nicknames is the brain's smoke alarm. Right. And so when, when, when the smoke alarm goes off in our house, you know, rarely, if ever, do we stop and go, huh, that's an interesting noise. And now that I think about it, it's actually kind of annoying. And I don't think I like, you know, we, 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 we just simply respond to it. We start looking for the fire. We, we look for the fire. We look for the smoke, right? I mean, most of the time when it goes off, it's a false alarm. So maybe we're not like screaming, running around the house, you know, with our, you know, pulling our hair out, but, but we're, we're, we're still responding, right? Mm -hmm. We're trying to find out, okay, what's going on? What's setting that off? Um, and, and maybe it's a false alarm, maybe it's not, but that's the whole point of having a smoke alarm mm -hmm. is so that it does catch our attention. And so in the same way, when we are triggered, our amygdala has gone off, the alarm bell has gone off and, and something is happening. Something has triggered us. It could be the words that someone says, it could be the way they're saying it, their tone, it could be their, their volume, or it could be, um, you know, the the presence of or the absence of you know other other factors that that play into that and every situation is going to be a little unique but that's part of what we have to learn to do is to slow down and to try and figure out what's going on well and i even remember if if you're okay with me sharing the throat clearing oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, I i share that a lot in my sessions with people yeah so early in our marriage um i would be clearing my throat and it would trigger kevin and so we finally got to talk about it. Well, well, I'll give some context. Yeah, so, go so, for it. So, so you would clear your throat. You're, <clears throat> you know, we all do that from time to time. But when she would do it, I would get very tense, and I would quickly look over at her with kind of this alertness in my face, and I and I would kind of go, you know, and and I think I would probably ask you like, what? Yeah, you'd get right. defensive, and you right. would ask like, what? I'm like, what? You know, and, and of course you're just like, uh, nothing. I'm just clearing my throat. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, but this would happen again and again. And I don't remember how long it took, you know, for us to address this or talk about it. Or First year of it. marriage is the way I'm yeah, remembering I mean, it. It's probably months, maybe even a year or two into the marriage. But, but at some point we finally realized, oh, this is something that my mom would line up. She would, she would clear her throat to get my attention. She'd go, <clears throat> Kevin, you know, and. Have you done, you know, and it was usually not for a good thing. It was usually because she was trying to get my attention. Hey, did you, did, did you, you know, did you do your homework? Did you take the trash out? Did you, you know, whatever. And, and, and so, 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 so what did that throat clearing start to mean to me growing up is that crap, you know, I'm in trouble. Something mm -hmm. I, I forgot to do something. And so you clearing your throat. Brought up that neural pathway and took right. you right there to your mom. Right. Uh, getting on to you for something. Yeah. Right. So, and that's what our triggers are. Our triggers usually are neural pathways. They're, they're things that have happened in our past that mean certain things. And we, as soon as that thing happens, our brains immediately go to, oh my gosh, this means this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. We, we, we're, we, our brain is very good at assigning meaning to things. Yeah. Sometimes to a fault. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's trying to save us time, but right. sometimes it gets in our way. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah, so, so let's, let's, let's follow this, this, this cycle here then, right? So we start there with that trigger, that cue. Now we're just going to respond in the moment, 
uh, part of what we have to do is go back and figure out, okay, what did trigger me? Why did that trigger me? But we're often not going to be cognizant of that right there in the moment. We're just going to react. Especially right when we're learning about this. I, I mean, you learn about this and you're like, you know, you may not catch it until after the whole thing has happened. But this right. is a great exercise to go back and look at the argument exactly. um, and, and get curious about that trigger. Right. Yeah. And now, and, and of course, just, you know, this probably should be obvious, but I'll say it anyways, this whole cycle, this whole pattern is so quick. It's instantaneous. It is so fast. We, it's broken down into these very, you know, uh, practical steps to make it easier for us to understand and, and, and absorb what's happening. But just realize that this is not like a, a very, you know, logical, uh, there's another word I'm looking for, but it's not a, it's, it's not this gradual, you know, it's not, it's not a slow process. It's no, fast. It's a matter of seconds or minutes. Right. Honestly, if it were slowed down in real life, <laughs> we probably wouldn't get into the explosive arguments that we get into it sure. because it's so fast and there's not time to think. And right. we're on that instinctive, you know, that in, we're using that instinctive brain um, and we're using our neural pathways like crazy. We're bouncing from one thing to the other thing to the other thing, and we're assigning meanings in matters of seconds. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so the, the 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 first stop there on that diagram, if you follow the arrow to the right, there is reactive feelings. Now, reactive feelings are another another way to refer to reactive feelings are secondary emotions. Mm -hmm. Secondary emotions, by nature, are reactive, and typically the emotions that fall in that category. We, we can we can kind of uh, uh, categorize under the umbrella of anger. Mm -hmm. So anger, sometimes people are triggered by that word anger, right? I'll sometimes, hey, is that, you know, man, you must feel kind of angry. You know, a lot of people are like, no, no, I'm not angry. You know, it's that, that, that there's there's a knee jerk, you know, rejection that sometimes we have to the word anger. I use the word anger just as a general description, and I think of it like an umbrella. And under that umbrella of anger, there's a whole spectrum mm -hmm. of emotions that will fall under that category. So maybe on the lower end of the spectrum is I'm mildly annoyed or irritated or bothered or, you know, frustrated or whatever. Or defensive or, right. yeah. And then on the other extreme, you know, livid, enraged, you know, uh, you know, things of that sort, like something really, really strong and intense. And then, you know, a whole range of other, you know, emotions that maybe fall somewhere in that category as far as their intensity goes. Yeah. But, but that's what we're talking about when we talk about reactive feelings and, and notice the descriptive terms felt sense in your body uh, meaning you're feeling this in your body, uh, which, which is how we experience emotions. Yeah. If you need more help with that, go to episode two. I talk all about physiological responses to emotions and how they feel in your body. And I give you exercises to get really clear on how your body experiences each emotion because all of us have different responses. It's very individualized. Yeah. Yeah. And, and important to know, uh, because if we don't have that awareness, then it's all the harder to get out of this cycle because we're not even aware of what I'm feeling and mm -hmm. what I'm experiencing. Yeah. We just go on autopilot at that right. point. Yeah. So, but, but, but that's, that's what's happening in that moment. We are, are experiencing reactive emotions because again, our brain has gone into fight or flight or freeze mode. Now this next part is really important. The story. Okay. And what we mean by the word story is that all of us, like I said earlier, we assign meaning to things. So the story in my head, you know, going back to you clearing your throat, the story in my head was, crap, I'm in trouble, mm -hmm. right? And, 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 and you can identify what the story is by just voicing what's going through your head. What's that inner dialogue? What are you saying to yourself? What What is that dialogue in your head? That's the story. You're, you're assigning meaning to what is happening. So in that example, I'm assigning meaning to, to your throat clearing, meaning I'm in trouble or you're trying to get my attention for something. And then we go up to that next part, how you cope. How you cope just basically means how do you respond in that moment? How are you, uh, you know, in the example they give there, you know, maybe you're protective, maybe you're reactive, maybe you're defensive. And I was, I was probably experiencing a, a couple of those things, right? I was clearly defensive. My body was kind of tense. Um, and I was reacting to you and I'd go, what? Mm -hmm. Right now let's follow this all the way around. So follow that, that up 
uh, and, and notice the arrow brings you right back down to trigger and cue. So in this example, my reaction of what triggered you how? Oh, so then I get very protective because what happens is I grew up with a, a mom that had some huge anger explosions um, and it often started with terse, like terse words, but it could get, it could get big. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, that terse what automatically puts me um, on the alert to protect myself and keep myself safe and all of my armor starts going up. Mm -hmm. So I'm feeling scared is okay. actually the emotion I'm feeling when that happens mm -hmm. because I don't know, like, are dishes going to go flying? Are people going to get hurt? What kind of words are going to be said? Um, Mom, if you're listening, I'm sorry. I love you. You're amazing. You've, we've come so far. But from my childhood, that is, that's where I was. And so your what automatically put me on, like, do I need to run? Mm -hmm. Do I need to defend myself? All my armor is going up and I'm getting ready to protect myself. Yeah. And, and, and it's interesting that you bring up fear because sometimes that is a reactive emotion, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes that is the, the initial, you know, uh, emotion that, that sometimes people will feel rather than like anger or defensiveness or irritated. However, it's probably fair to say that wh while that was maybe your initial, um, emotional response depending on how aggressive or attacking i am that might bring up some of those reactive feelings as well probably anger as well this like sense of injustice of yeah. i didn't do anything to you i mm -hmm. was just over here minding my business mm -hmm. why are you snapping at me right. yeah so and, 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 that and everything well. everything you just said right there is is what oh yeah that's my story right that's my story that's, this is not fair that's yeah that's the, yeah that's the inner dialogue going on this isn't fair this is why is he saying that? I didn't do anything. I was just clearing my throat, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's all part of the I'm internet. blameless is what's coming up for me. <laughs> I'm blameless. I'm just over here cooking your dinner. Right. So, <laughs> right. yeah. And, 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 and that's a common one, right? Because nobody wants to be at fault. Nobody wants to be the monster. Nobody wants to be the bad guy. And so, yes, we're, we're often very quick to proclaim our, our blamelessness, mm -hmm. our our innocence. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and so a lot of this goes back to recognizing, uh, the origins of, of why this happens, right? We live in a very black and white world. We live in a very logical world. We live in a very binary thinking world where, I mean, think about it. You, you don't ever hear the judge in a, in a courtroom say you are kind of guilty. You know, it, it's, it's, you're either guilty or you're not. Right. Mm -hmm. And therefore I think we absorb a lot of that into our relationships and think, well, I'm not guilty. Mm -hmm. I'm blameless. Mm -hmm. I didn't do anything wrong. And while that might technically be true, what we have to recognize is that anytime we are in a system in this case, it's a relationship system. For anyone that wants to look more into that, it's called systems theory, and and in the in the realm of you know marriage and family, we we refer to it as family systems theory. Uh, but but in a system, in this case, you know uh, you know uh, 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 um, two partners, uh, we affect one another. Whether you like it or not, you affect one another. That doesn't mean you're you're necessarily to blame or at fault for how your partner is responding in a situation, but we cannot deny the fact that we are playing some sort of a role, some sort of a part. Yeah. I always say that I'm not responsible for, I'm not responsible for your emotions, but I'm responsible to understand how my behavior is affecting you and your emotions. Mm -hmm. So I'm responsible for my part. I'm not responsible for your part. Now, in our in our situation, me clearing my throat, I should be allowed to clear my throat, <laughs> right. right? But I am responsible for my part in understanding what's going on for you. Yeah. Um, and you're responsible for your part in understanding the story that you're telling yourself about me clearing my throat. Mm -hmm. And so um, it really helps, I find, especially um, in relationships that have a long history of well, codependent relationships in particular, mm -hmm. where one partner is taking responsibility for the feelings of the other person right. and the other person is blaming, um, understanding that difference is really helpful 
that you're responsible for your feelings and your story, but I'm responsible to understand why that is happening. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm responsible to empathize with that. And Mm -hmm. I'm responsible to understand what's going on for you so that I can work with you. Right. If I want to have a relationship with you. Right. If I don't want to have a relationship, completely different story. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so, so going back to this cycle, if, you know, I triggered you there in the middle, you had your own experience of reactive feelings, that story in your head and how you coped, how you dealt with it in the moment would then in turn come back around and potentially trigger me again. Now, mm-hmm. that's part of why this is kind of an infinity symbol, because if you start to trace your finger along those arrows, it starts to go around and around and around and around and around. And we can trigger our, each other again and again and again. Mm-hmm. And, and and that's why, the, the you know, we refer to this as a cycle because it feels very cyclical. In fact, there's probably a lot of you out there that if you were to describe your conflict, you know, with your, your partner, your spouse, you would probably say it feels very predictable, yeah. right? Sometimes we might even say that in our heads, you know, we, we, we might think to ourselves, oh, great, here we go again, yep. you know, and, and we can almost anticipate what's going to happen. Yep. You're going to say this, I'm going to do this, and then you're going to react this way. And then it just feels very, uh, hopeless. Yeah. One of us is going to stomp off. The other one is going to, you know, and then we're not going to be able to talk. It's crazy to me because uh, as I'm, you know, looking at this triggers, looking at this diagram again and seeing the triggers and just recognizing this, like sometimes we say it spirals out of control. This is what this is. Mm -hmm. Or people will say they're really good. They know all the buttons to push. Mm -hmm. And those buttons are those triggers. They're the places where we know exactly where to twist the knife. Mm -hmm. We know exactly this thing to say or do Mm -hmm. to transfer this feeling of I was wounded Mm, now I'm going to wound you. Right. And we just really wind out of control very quickly that way. Right. Well, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because you're right. That's that when it does start to spiral out of control, that's where we can often say and do some very mean and cruel things. Mm-hmm. Right. And when we are in the midst of that, it can feel very intentional. Mm-hmm. Right. So this is this is kind of a tricky subject to address because on the one hand, is it intentional? Question mark. Right. Is it am I being mean on purpose? That That's not a, a direct. It, we can't say just yes or no. And the reason for that, again, is because, number one, where is our mind? In reptilian brain mode. That's right. We are in a life or death state of, you know, state of mind. And just like, you know, a lot of, a lot of you can probably imagine or picture, uh, situations where a wild animal has been, uh, cornered. Right. And, 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 and sometimes you'll see this like on animal shows where there's an injured animal Mm -hmm. and they're trying to help it. But how's this wild animal reacting? Claws out. It's trying to bite. It's, yeah. Right, I mean, right. cats. I think of wild cats in particular. Yeah. 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 yeah I remember our, our cat that we had, you know, a number of years ago that I think we took her to the vet and she had some sort of, uh, I can't remember if they sewed her up or something, but we had to apply medicine on her and it was a nightmare trying to get her to hold still. And it's, so it's, it's that that's basically what's happening. Cause remember, folks, we are animals at our core, you know, you know, uh, we have evolved from, um, simpler species. Mm -hmm. And, and so we still have those parts of our brain, uh, those parts of the brain that are active, uh, in these types of moments. I like how Mike McCargue mm -hmm. talks about it. He talks about, um, if, what is the name of his book we just read? Uh, you are a miracle and you're a pain in the ass. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. So he talks about, um, he, he has this like picture of an alligator with a dog standing on top of it, with a human standing on top of that as a way to describe our brain, that we have a reptilian brain with a mammalian brain wrapped around it with a prefrontal cortex or neo neocortex wrapped around that a human brain wrapped around that and that our quickest brain when we're in danger or we feel cornered as kevin's talking about it's that reptilian brain that comes online um and that you know our it takes longer for our human brain to kick in Mm -hmm. 
when we're in danger, it, it can take up to like a minute for that to, to kick in. But our reptilian brain is already triggered and on the go because right. if it took us a minute to move out of the way of a speeding car, mm-hmm. we'd all be dead. Exactly. Yeah. So, so it's important to remind ourselves that there is a purpose to that. It's, it's that way on purpose. It's not a failing. It's not the carnal, you know, natural, man. natural man in us. It's not, you know, this, this, this weak part of ourselves that we have to overcome per se. Do, do we need to overcome it in the sense of, not always reacting and flying off the the handle, definitely, right? But mm-hmm. but that requires training. It requires practice, right? Um, it requires I, giving yourself a pause right. since we know that we need time for that human brain to come online. One of the best things we learn to do is to pause, right. like to notice, oh, I've been triggered. I'm feeling anger. And let's put the brake on for a minute so right. I can get my brain back online. Right. Right. Yeah. But again, this, this requires training and practice, uh, a lot of which none of us have ever had because how many of us remember our parents sitting us down and teaching us how to resolve conflict, right? How many of us remember taking a class in elementary and middle and high school about relationships and, and how to work through conflict? You know, f- few, if any of us have ever had that kind of education because again, we live in an emotionally unhealthy world and emotions have traditionally been treated as, as weakness and, and, and bad things that uh, we shouldn't feel. And well, so, and on top of that, I mean, the research has really just started coming out on this. Right. I mean, I remember when you and I were in college and, you know, Dr. Marshall was telling us, um, you know, we're just now starting to study healthy families. Just now. This was like, what, 1999, 2000. 2000. Yep. And they're saying, we're just now starting to study he- healthy families. We're just now starting to study healthy individuals. The study started in like the late 80s, early 90s. And we didn't get results from those until the 2000s, the early 2000s. And I mean, Brene Brown didn't start her research on shame resilience and vulnerability until the late 2000s. The late 2000s. So, I mean, it's really easy to look back and be like, why wasn't I taught these things? They couldn't have taught us these things. This is new information. This is stuff that we're so lucky to get to learn now and teach our kids. And what I love is seeing our kids come home. They're learning emotional intelligence in elementary school now. Mm -hmm. Kent's blowing away his teacher. Our Mm -hmm. son is blowing away his teacher because she's like, Let's let's name all the emotions. Let's see how many you can name. And he'll name all the emotions and then draw new faces for new emotions. And uh, just because we talk about this at the dinner table, but they're learning about it in elementary school, but it was not available yeah. until now. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's important to realize just how recent a lot of this is. And, and anytime something has been discovered, you know, in the world of research and science, you have to give it a couple of decades uh, decades, a couple of decades for it to really start to permeate the, the rest of the culture and, and people. And then it will still take yet another few decades after that, uh, for you to see any real significant change, I think on a societal level. Yeah. I would almost say like an, a whole generation at least. Um, before yeah. you start seeing that, because what you need is what's happening with our sons, where they're being taught about empathy, they're being taught about emotional intelligence, they're being taught about conflict resolution as part of public education, which is amazing. Right. They're going to grow up, and it's not everybody that's being taught these things. So, you know, some schools are being taught this, some are not, mm-hmm. but they're going to grow up, and you're going to have a generation of people who understand this and have grown up with this in childhood that are then turning around and teaching their kids, and there's more people who know about this stuff. So I would say it takes a generation, if not two sure. for it to really, um, sink in. Yeah. 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 Well, and it's a gradual process. So it's, uh, it's always going to take time, but, but yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's where we're at, right? That's, that's where our mind is at. And so going back to that, that question, that dilemma, are we intentionally being hurtful and mean to each other? I would say that the answer is yes and no. Yes, because obviously we're the ones saying it and doing it. We are ultimately responsible for what we say and do. No one else can be blamed for that. So yes, in that sense that it is intentional, we're obviously saying it, we're obviously doing those things. But then I would also argue that 
no, it's not completely our fault because a lot of how we're reacting and what we're saying and doing in that moment is just simply a knee jerk reaction, right? You know, when the doctor takes the little mallet and, and, you know, checks your reflexes on your knee, your knee, you know, your leg is going to, to, to bounce out a little bit because that, uh, is how your, your body is wired. You're not bad. You know, if, if your knee, you know, if your leg bounces out, because again, that's, that's how we're wired. And so in the same sense, we, you know, or, or going back to that wild animal that's cornered, it's just simply reacting because it doesn't know any better. Mm -hmm. And so, so we really need to give ourselves and, and the other people in our lives, some grace and some flexibility for being capable of saying and doing mean things, not because they're a quote unquote bad person or a mean person or an abusive person, but because they're human. Mm -hmm. And this is what humans do when we are pushed to our limits. What would you say for people um, who feel like they are in abusive relationships where, you know, abuse, emotional or mental abuse, like how do you draw that line between this is a normal reaction and we are responsible and we're also like, how do you? It's, it's, it's probably a combination of things, right? I mean, some of us are hypersensitive to certain situations and certain words and, and, and reactions from people and something very well could feel abusive, mm -hmm. even though the other person wasn't necessarily intending to be abusive. Makes sense. And so, so again, that's, that's kind of a gray area. You, you can't necessarily say it's one or the other because that perspective is reality, you know, comes into play here that I might be experiencing. So let, let's take, for example, somebody who grows up in a home where their parents quote unquote, never argued right now, of course, that is not there is no such thing. All couples, you know, have conflict. Yes, there are some couples who literally never yell or, or break things or insult each other. And it appears from the outside that they don't have conflict, that they don't fight, that they don't argue. But the reality is they do have conflict. It's just quiet. Mm -hmm. Or it's the, the type where, where they just quietly kind of slink away and nothing is ever really resolved. Yeah. And so, so. Or where we're in, one person always gets their way and the right. other person just, just submits. Submits. Right. Yeah. Right. But in that example, uh, that there are a lot of people who have grown up with in, in environments like that and with parents who are like that. And sometimes they go into their adult lives and into their own relationships thinking that's what a healthy relationship looks like. Mm -hmm. And so when they find themselves in conflict with their partner or spouse, and let's say their partner or spouse grew up in, an, in the, the, the opposite uh, extreme where their parents were yelling and screaming and breaking things and cussing and, and, and hurting each other in all sorts of ways. Guess, guess what those two people's norms are. You know, when it comes to conflict, the, the one person who grew up in the quiet home thinks uh, in a relationship, we don't argue, or if there's conflict or disagreements, you know, we definitely don't yell or scream or insult each other. And then this other person, they have a completely different norm, mm -hmm. right? In that person's head, um, you yell, you scream, you, 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 you break things, you know, and that's your norm. Now, the person who grew up in a quiet environment might experience a yell or even just a raised voice from their, their, their partner and spouse, they might experience that as abusive. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and now a lot of us could probably argue, well, he's not, you know, he or she isn't actually being abusive, you know, but, but guess what? That it might, it might, it might feel, feel like abuse. Right. It, it might, might feel traumatic. Right. So, so, so that's part of what we have to figure out, right? That's part of what we have to talk through and recognize, okay, Maybe, maybe I, I can, I can acknowledge, I can validate that how I'm reacting, how I'm talking, you are experiencing that as abusive and maybe there's room to become more or, or less sensitive mm -hmm. towards, towards, uh, th this type of situation, right? There's, there, there has to be a, a you know, an, an ability to discuss and kind of work through mm -hmm. a scenario like that. Mm -hmm. When should people seek help? Before they get in a relationship. 
<laughs> <laughs> in other words, I, I believe that therapy and counseling should be part of our preventative medicine, mm -hmm. right? That, that we don't go to the doctor when we have stage four cancer. We want to go as soon as we sense something is off or something feels different. I love it. Okay. I love it. So that, that's, that's, that's the short answer, but we, we often don't do that, right? We, 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 we some, wait until it's malignant. Yes. We <laughs> sometimes do wait until that very last minute. And, and, and I think there's a lot of reasons for that, which we can get into another time. But um, yeah, I mean, basically the, the, the sooner the better. I mean, if we're practicing preventative medicine when it comes to our mental health and our relationship, then we're going to be able to nip a lot of these problems in the bud long before they become very habitual and cyclical. I love it. And before they escalate. Exactly. Yeah. That makes sense to me. Yeah. So we've talked about the cycle and going back and forth and back and forth and how it can spiral out of control and we can trigger each other over and over again. Are there any other parts of the diagram that you want to, to well, talk about? Well, if we go back to the trigger right above that, you'll see insecurities and fears about your connection. And that's that's why these these moments prove to be triggering. Right. And, and this is where we can get lost in the content. I mentioned that earlier, mm -hmm. right, that we get lost in the content. So if I walk in the door and I expect you to greet me with a hug and a kiss and you don't, then I might be a little irritated. I might be a little bothered by that. I might bring that up and maybe you get angry and defensive and go, well, I was, I'm, I'm exhausted. I, you know, X, Y, and Z happened today, you know, and then the kids weren't doing this. And, and then you can start listing off all these things, which are valid, but, but to me, maybe it sounds like an excuse mm -hmm. for, for why I'm not important enough to greet me with a, a hug and a kiss, or even just a, a greeting mm -hmm. of, Hey babe, welcome home or something, mm -hmm. you know? And so then, and so then we might continue to argue about this and I might say, well, gee, it sure would be nice to, to feel appreciated around here. It sure would be nice. I didn't realize it was so hard for you to, to just say hello to me as I walk in the door, you know, yep. and, and, and you can obviously start to see how that starts to escalate. Now, what are we actually arguing about? You feeling love and belonging. Yes, but that's not going to be immediately um, noticeable to, to most of us. Yeah. Because we're not aware of that. What does it seem like we're arguing about? We see, It seems like we're arguing about whether um, she, whether the wife should greet with a hug and a kiss or not, or whether that's reasonable to expect a hug and a kiss or... Right. And, and that's where we can get lost in the content. Now it's important. Now it, going back to that little, that little section there, right above the trigger and the cue, our insecurities and our fears about the connection are what make these little moments so triggering. Cause if you think about it, if we're, if we're being honest, the things that trigger us and get us going in this cycle are almost always going to be very small things. Mm -hmm. And they're almost always going to be seemingly benign things. And we'll even catch ourselves sometimes in the midst of an argument or afterwards kind of slapping our, our head and going, what are we even arguing about? You know, mm -hmm. sometimes we forget what we're fighting about or other times, or, or, or we, we realize what we're fighting about, but it seems so stupid. Yeah. It seems so benign. And it's like, why are we arguing about somebody taking the trash out? Why are we arguing about who did or didn't vacuum the floor or whatever? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, 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 so that should be a clue and a reminder to us that when we are triggered by something, it's not just the triggering event. It's follow that arrow down, follow it all the way down to the heart, right? This is, you know, what's that phrase getting to the heart of the matter. That's what this is about. This, that is, is going to help us get to the heart of the matter and figure out what is actually going on below the surface. Mm -hmm. And that is the part that's hard to see. Like it says there, what your partner can't see because of the fear driven cycle. And this is the vulnerable piece, right? Uh, if anyone's been to therapy and, you know, in, you know, recent years, you, you hear a lot about vulnerability. You hear about the importance of being vulnerable. Vulnerability also seems to bring up, you know, the idea of being weak. And, and I think that's why we sometimes balk at the idea of being vulnerable. For some reason, when I, when I picture vulnerability, I picture, you know, like a, a, a knight in shining armor, you know, that when you have that armor on, you're protected, 
you're you're guarded you're 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 safe but you're also picture that knight in shining armor trying to get intimate with you know with 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 you know someone else you know yeah. it's with hard, their armor on with their armor on right it's hard to do that right it's it's hard to it, it would be hard to feel you know intimately close to one another if 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 one person's naked and the other person has a full set of armor cold on. metal on oh my gosh <laughs> i'm over here like shivering and so so taking that armor off yes does make you vulnerable but it also allows us to have connection and closeness with somebody. In order to be sexually intimate, you have to take the armor off. You have mm -hmm. to take the clothing off, right? Um, and in order to be emotionally intimate, we have to learn to be emotionally naked. And that's what this is. Yeah. And it feels risky, but that's mm -hmm. why vulnerability is such a courageous thing. I love how uh, Brene Brown talks about like, the two sides of the coin that vulnerability, like there is no way to do anything that involves risk that isn't both vulnerable and courageous. Like, right. Yeah. To be vulnerable is courage. Yeah. And, 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 and that's another term because I'll actually say that to people in my, my room. Sometimes I'm like, you know, if they share something vulnerable, if they open up about something, I said, that was really courageous. And nine times out of 10, they're like, uh, no, not really, you know, because in our mind, we think courage and bravery is jumping on, you know, running into a burning building and, you know, saving somebody from drowning or something like that. Mm -hmm. No, courage is confronting our fears. Mm -hmm. Courage is doing something that's uncomfortable and new and different. Mm -hmm. That is courage. That is bravery. And so anytime we do feel you know, lost or confused or, or uncomfortable or anything like that. And we do it anyways. That's courage. Yeah, I agree. And anytime we're opening ourselves up to possible risk and we do it anyway, because opening our hearts to someone, really letting someone in mm -hmm. without keeping that wall there, that barrier there, we're giving them access to our soft, smushy self. Exactly. And that is the way to connection. It's the way to have that real soul bond that mm -hmm. I think a lot of us are longing for. Mm -hmm. But it's also risky because people have access to our softest, squishiest places. Exactly. And um, and and it's courageous to let someone in in that way. Right. Yeah. So so there's I think there's a couple of conclusions we can uh, come to from that that what you just said right there. Number one, there is no such thing as close emotional connectedness and intimacy without vulnerability. Yeah. And so if your spouse or your family of origin or your friends or, you know, the people you hang out with, if you are not able to be emotionally vulnerable with them, it is not a completely safe environment. Yeah, that's true. Now they, it can, it can still be relatively safe, mm -hmm. right? But if I cannot take that armor off completely, then it's not a completely safe environment. Yeah. I think there's levels of safety and, and, you know, that we can feel with different people. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right. We might feel safe in certain ways, but maybe not in others. Correct. And we allow ourselves to take off the armor in those areas, but mm -hmm. maybe not other areas. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, you know, so, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll hear my couples talk about that, you know, like, because when we're talking about safety and vulnerability, we inevitably the topic of trust comes up. Uh-huh. Right. And if I were to, you know, if there are a couple to come in and they're just yelling and bickering and super angry and loud and, and you know, uh, hurtful towards each other. If I asked them if they trusted each other, they'd say no, maybe, or they would definitely say yes Oh, because they might say, well, yeah. I mean, like if, if I were, you know, about to get run over by a train or if I were about to, you know, if I, I don't know, lost my job or, you know, got I, I sick. got sick or went to the hospital, they would probably trust their partner to, to, to take care of them and, and to show up and be there for them. Mm-hmm. But maybe they don't always trust them to, to be a safe emotional place. That makes sense. Somebody that I can share my heart with. 
uh, it, it depends, right? That there, there's no definitive answer. Cause you're right that, that there would be some that just maybe don't trust them at all, yeah. you know, in, in any area. But generally speaking, I would say that we often trust each other to do the big things, but we don't always trust each other with our heart. Yeah. And if this sounds familiar to you guys, I'm actually doing an episode on the seven ingredients of trust. I use it with my clients all the time because often when we say, I don't trust you, Mm -hmm. it feels like a personal attack. Right. Um, It feels like an attack on our innocence, an attack on our worthiness. But we're finding that it's so much easier to build relationships when we can say, I worry about you being reliable and Mm -hmm. doing what you're say, doing what you say you're going to do. Or Mm -hmm. I worry about you. Um, or I feel like I can't trust you to keep confidences or those sorts of things. So if this sounds familiar, we're going to be talking about this later because trust is a big part of intimacy as well. Right. right. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's, it's so so going down to that heart again, then, you know, the this is this is the vulnerable piece. And this, you know, inevitably, when we talk about the cycle, people will almost, will, will almost always follow that up with the question of, well, how do we get out of the cycle? Mm-hmm. How do we not get into the cycle? How do we avoid it and so forth? And and I, and I think one thing we, we need to state here is that number one, the cycle is normal. There is no such thing as not getting into the cycle. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I can't emphasize that enough because a lot of people will vilify the cycle, mm-hmm. right? I mean, we, we might even call it a negative cycle, right? And, and, and we don't want to be in a negative cycle and, oh crap, we're in that cycle again, you know? And so, so one thing we have to normalize is that no matter how long you've been together, no matter how healthy your relationship is, you still have a cycle and you're still going to fall into that cycle from time to time. Now, as you get better, as you get healthier, as you create that safety between the two of you, we experience the cycle less. And we experience it much less violently. So like you and I still have our cycle, Mm -hmm. but now our, our conflict voices sound a lot like these voices that we're using right now where, where I can say, Hey, I'm starting to, you know, I feel angry. This happened. I got triggered. This is what I feel, you know, and we're able, we're able to discuss and empathize. And it sounds a lot like regular conversation. Right. You know, there might still be tears because of all of the feelings, but we're able to just talk back and forth and um, it's still conflict, but it's not, it's not the conflict that we had maybe earlier in our marriage where mm-hmm. I was throwing toilet paper rolls. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so yeah, so the, the cycle, you will always have a cycle. And, and, and again, I, I need to emphasize that so that we're not seeking to never get into the cycle. I I have couples come back in future sessions and, and lament the fact that they got into the cycle again. Oh man, we were doing so good. You know, and and in fact, that's often used as a, a gauge for how well we're doing. I have a lot of couples come back and go, well, we didn't argue this week. And on the one hand, yeah, that's great. That's nice, but it doesn't necessarily mean that things are improving yet. It just maybe means that we're getting good about avoiding. Avoiding the argument, avoiding the conflict. Right. Like, I'm going to hold it in, but then that kind of sets us up for an eruption in some oh, ways, yeah. too. It's, I, I, I compare, you know, us to humans and pressure. I, I compare us as humans to pressure cookers and volcanoes, mm-hmm. right? That pressure inevitably will build up and either it, it, it becomes explosive or it, it creates a meltdown. Yeah. Well, and in the emotional episode, we talk about that, that emotions that you don't deal with, they don't just like go away. No, they stay there and wait for you to deal with them. Yeah. So, yeah, it's yeah, that's kind of like building a dam, you know, and you can only build the dam so high and eventually that water will break through or find its way over. So, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. So so that that vulnerability piece is key in understanding, uh, you know, how to get out of that cycle. And, And again, just to reiterate that cycle always happens with time and with progress it happens less and it's less intense um but that that vulnerable piece uh, is kind of ultimately where we need to get down to to get out of the cycle now that's of course easier said than done um i think the steps that are important to recognize is is well number one we're talking about the cycle and so i would say that's probably the first step right mm-hmm. we you've used the rain acronym before yeah 
Yeah. So I use the RAIN acronym. I think I use it a little bit differently than you do, but the concept's the same. Um, I use it for emotional awareness and working through emotions, but I like how you use it working through this cycle as well. So do you want to kind of talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So R-A-I-N is the acronym and the R stands for recognize. Mm -hmm. You're right. So, so, so number one, in order to get out of a cycle, we have to recognize that we're in a cycle. And, and it's important to, to reiter reiterate that notice in that, in, in the diagram, there is no like starting place, you know, in the sense of it's your fault or my fault or something like that. We both play a part in creating mm -hmm. the cycle. And so because we co-create it, then it takes a team effort to then get out of the cycle. Makes sense. And, and, and so that first step is just simply recognizing, you know, it's like, it, it, and it's just as simple as like, oh crap, here we go. You know, we're doing that thing. We're, we're in that cycle again. And then I guess the next step, the A would, would be to allow and accept the fact that we are in a cycle. Yeah. Again, that's why we can't demonize the cycle because then we immediately feel shame for falling into the cycle and what we're doing here is we're recognizing, oh crap, we're doing that cycle and we're allowing and accepting the fact that it is happening. Yeah. Well, and I find it goes back to, you know, when you won't acknowledge something, you can't solve it. And so often we want to, we have this like dishonesty inside of us about what's happening. Mm -hmm. we, we want to deny that things are happening, mm -hmm. skirt around it, minimize it, pretend like it's something else actually. But if we can if we can recognize that we're in the cycle and just accept that it's happening and that and be honest with ourselves about it, then we can start to work through it. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then, and then the I, uh, would, would stand for investigate. And, and, and basically what that means is we, we need to get curious and we need to, to do that with kindness. We need to, we need to investigate what's happening here. Okay. What, what just triggered you? Yeah. I noticed when I said this that you suddenly got kind of angry or defensive. Uh, and, oh, yeah, okay. And then when you said that, that's how it affected me. Mm -hmm. And and, and we're just, we're, we're, we're investigating. We're, we're getting curious. We're trying to figure out what just happened here, right? Like picture yourself on one of those crime investigation, you know, shows where they out on the table and they're trying to put the pieces together and they're trying to figure out what happened. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so that's, that's more or less yeah. kind of how we're approaching it. You're just trying to get all the clues so that you can understand what parts of this dance just played out. And then in, in this case, the end would stand for nurture right? Which basically just means we're, we're trying to nurture my partner and validate what you're experiencing, what you're going through. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, th this requires heavy, heavy, heavy doses of empathy. Now we're not going to go into all the, you know, the inside outs of what empathy is and isn't, but, uh, but that, that's a crucial piece here. Empathy in a nutshell is being able to put ourselves in the shoes of the other person. Yeah. The phrase I use a lot in, in, in probably with you and, and also in, in my counseling room is that makes sense. Yeah. And, and I will say that because when someone is explaining or what the story in their head was and why they reacted the, the way they did, it makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. And I'll go, that makes sense. You know, uh, you know, when, when he said, you know, I hate you, uh, because you gave him the cold sh shoulder when he came in the door. I can honestly say that makes sense. Maybe we shouldn't have said, I hate you. Maybe we shouldn't have reacted a, a certain way, but, but the reality is we're very purposeful beings as human beings. We're not, as Brene Brown says, we're not sucking on purpose, Yep. right? So if I am hurtful to you, it's not because I woke up that morning and thought to myself, you know, I think it would be a really good idea to, to, to be mean and cruel to my wife when I get home tonight. Right. And, and, and that's why going back to that word intention, right. Am I intentionally being mean? Yes and no. Right. Yeah. Cause I'm not, I'm not planning for that. I'm not, you know, intentionally being mean in that sense, but 
I'm still being mean because of how I'm reacting in that moment. So yeah. it's, 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 you know, sometimes it's kind of hard to, to figure out what exactly that means, but that's, that's, you know, th that's, that's what it boils down to is, is when we really understand what we're feeling, how, how we're interpreting that the story in our head, guess what? More often than not, it does make sense. If, if we're being empathetic and trying to put ourselves in the shoes of the other person. Well, you just made such a good point too, that it really does require empathy because we can say that makes sense and not mean it. Mm -hmm. And people can feel that. Oh yeah. They can feel when you're just trying to shut them up and it won't make sense until we try to take on what would that feel like if that were my reality, if that's the way I viewed this, if this were my past story informing, you know, the present, how would that feel to be this other person? Have I ever experienced feelings that are similar to that? And what that might, what might that feel like for me if that were my reality? And just trying to understand that. And then in that moment, we really can say, well, that makes sense to me. If, right. if, if this is the reality we're working with then it makes sense that this is how I would feel and then this is how I would react. Right. Yeah. Right. But th this, of course, requires what I would call leaps of faith mm -hmm. when it comes to trusting each other and really believing our partner. In fact, I remember there was, you know, there was an argument, you know, a, a number of years ago and I was probably just reacting angrily or defensively towards you. And I'm sure you had said this before, but for some reason in this, this moment, it, it really sank in. You, you asked me to, to slow down and you asked me to, to, to said, you know, Kevin, this is me. Do you really think I would purposely hurt you or purposely want to, you know, what, whatever, whatever had happened, mm -hmm. you know, and I honestly couldn't think of you wanting to intentionally purposely want to be hurtful and, and so forth. And so that was kind of a, a, a really powerful moment for me because, because I really started to assume the best in you mm -hmm. a, a lot more, not all the time, right? We, we, we all have that tendency to assume the worst in each other, but, but I started to assume the best in you a lot more often moving forward. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's, that's often what is lacking. We're, 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 we're because of that, that fear, because of the, the hurt, we have a tendency to, to assume the worst mm -hmm. in each other. And, and so we really need to reverse that process of assuming the best in each other so that we can get down to the heart. Mm -hmm. As long as we're assuming the worst in each other, we're stuck up in that cycle up there. And, and as soon as we can back towards assuming the best in each other, we can get down into that heart, which is the vulnerable primary emotions. That's where we can start to, you know, and, and that's, that's what all those little words are down there. That's where we can share the sadness that I'm feeling, the fear that I'm feeling, the hurt, the loneliness, all of these things, which are very, very, um, vulnerable. And that key part right there, all of these vulnerable primary emotions are about our attachment needs, mm -hmm. which usually tend to boil down to wanting to be loved and accepted and, and valued mm -hmm. in my relationship with you. Yeah. And if I'm not feeling valued, if I'm not feeling heard, if I'm not feeling like I matter to you, then that's where the fear and the defensiveness and the reactive emotions come from. That makes so much sense. That makes sense. Did you hear me say it? <laughs> And I, and I hope it makes sense to everybody. Right. And now obviously this is, you know, we're talking about it and we're doing it in a, in a calm, collected manner. The real moment where the rubber meets the road is once we're in a situation like this again, Yeah. you know, can we start to recognize, can we start to pull ourselves back, uh, from that, that cycle that we're stuck in something we should probably address real quick. Um, is that we tend to take on one of two different roles when we're in the cycle. I'm glad you're addressing this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, and it's, and, and it's important to, to recognize because oftentimes one of us will take on the role of a withdrawer and the other person might take on the role of a pursuer. 
Now, the withdrawer tends to be somebody who withdraws, pulls away, disengages. Sometimes the withdrawer is, is uncomfortable with emotion as well. Not always, but, but sometimes there's a discomfort with emotion. That's part of why they withdraw and disengage, right? The withdrawer might be, have the mindset of, this is stupid. Let's not argue. Uh, it's, it's, it gets ridiculous. You know, it, things get out of control when we get emotional, you know, it, it, things of that sort, right? That, that, that's usually their mindset. They're, they're the ones that usually want to cool down and cool off. Early in our marriage, I was definitely more of the withdrawer. And I was the pursuer. And you were the pursuer. But now here's the kicker, right? When you withdraw, when you disengage, yes, time will eventually help you cool off, right? You know, I mean, that, that's that's where we get that phrase, time heals all things. By the way, that is not 100% true. Um, time does help with healing, but it, time in and of itself does not heal things. But... That's a, that's, that's another, a whole nother podcast. That's a whole nother podcast. Uh, but we do need to disengage. We do need to sometimes take a break, not always, but sometimes we do. And that's part of the recognition part of the rain acronym, right? When we recognize that we're in that cycle, maybe it means, maybe it means let's just take a break, right? Take some deep breaths, go for a walk, go into separate rooms, right? Whatever you need to do to let that, you know, that anger kind of pass, and then we can come back and that's where we can start to kind of investigate and get curious and, and try to discuss and understand what was happening, what was going on and so forth. The pause is to get your human brain back online, get exactly. out of rept reptilian mode exactly, so that you can discuss things logically like the mature adults that you are right. um, most of the time. Right. But if you're taking a pause and never coming back, right. that actually is detrimental to your relationship. It's not helpful to, you know, like just disengage from the reptilian brain and then come back and pretend like nothing happened. That actually drives distance and right. it drives distrust. Right. Well, and, and so and so we have to recognize that these two different styles, the withdrawing and the pursuing, they both have pros and cons. And the the the, the pros here are exactly what we're talking about. You know, it gives you some time, gives you some space. We're not letting it escalate to that unhealthy level where we're saying, doing things that we can't take back. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a, that's a huge plus. That's a huge pro. But of course the con is like you said, uh, early in our relationship, I wouldn't come back. Mm -hmm. I would withdraw and I would kind of probably subconsciously pat myself on the back because we weren't arguing we weren't fighting because that's that's of the devil we well and often you looked like the bigger person because right. you were mature and you withdraw and i would freak the f out yeah well and, and and i don't know if i you can let me know if you remember but i i was definitely saying it in my head and i may have even verbally said this to you that something along the lines of you know like if you were just kind of an emotional mess i would say you know what? We'll talk about this when you're an adult. <laughs> once you've once you've calmed down, once you've collected yourself, then we can talk. You know, and and I don't know. Maybe I did say you can once you be, you know are, are an adult again or so. I don't know. I, I I'm sure it was condescending. I'm sure it was very mansplaining. But that was you know that was the example that you know our society provided, mm -hmm. our church provided. You know that that to be a mature, collected adult, you don't lose it you yeah. don't lose your you know, your temper and and yell and fly off the handle so yeah uh but yeah but that was the con that was the negative of uh withdrawing is that i would not come back i would not re-engage mm -hmm. now the pursuer um tends to pursue right they tend to want to talk sometimes they 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 want to fight about it which is just an escalated way of talking and we and, want resolutions. We right. want, we, we can't calm down until right. we've talked it through and right. we can't, um, go to sleep at night. And then the withdrawer is like snoring beside us. You guys know <laughs> what I'm talking about. They're like snoring beside us and you just want to like throat punch them in the middle of the night <laughs> because you're sitting there still stewing. You have things you've got to say and they're snoring and you're just like, oh no. Yeah. So I know you guys know what that's like. That was that was our marriage early in, early in our marriage. That was us. Kevin would calm down. I would get more upset as the pursuer wanting to talk and him being unwilling to talk. He'd fall asleep, no problem. We had to wake up at 4 a.m. for that janitorial job. 
And I would be awake until two in the morning, three in the morning, stewing, and he's over there sleeping like a baby, and I just want to throat punch him. <laughs> so, um, yes, and now, now if you look at the diagram, you can see how those two start to feed off of each other, and and how as the withdrawer withdraws, the pursuer kind of gets louder and bigger which caused the withdrawer to want to withdraw even more, yep. which caused the pursuer to pursue even more. And, 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 and that's, that's part of why we call it a vicious cycle because we do take on these two roles. Now that is not always the case, um, where we're both pursuing and withdrawing. Sometimes we will trade roles depending on the subject. Yep. So for example, I, I traditionally would pursue you sexually more than you, uh, and you would withdraw more there. Yeah. But but depending on the on the subject or the topic, sometimes one of us will be more of a pursuer, and the and the other person will be more of a withdrawer. Now there are also situations, and the, these are rare. Um, there are situations where both people are withdrawers, and or both, both people, people are, are pursuers. pursuers. Right. So it just depends. Um, depends on the situation. Depends on the relationship. But it's it's important to I think to highlight. Uh, those two roles and, yeah. and the and the parts that they do play. Well, and it's interesting as you got more emotionally intelligent and as you got into the therapy world and got better at handling, like you got to practice handling conflict in your therapy room all the time for like five, six years there. And you got really adept at recognizing triggers, being empathetic. And as I was learning to do those things, you were becoming really expert at doing those things. And we switched roles there for a while where Kevin was actually this empathetic pursuer of tell me what triggered you and let's talk about it. And I would withdraw because I didn't want to be the um, infantile one that was, you know, saying or doing crazy things. I wasn't as emotionally invo or evolved, I guess you would say. And I it was embarrassing to me and mm. that I couldn't handle things with such finesse and um, was still learning to feel my emotions and still learning to communicate them. And I would get flustered. And so there were times that I would withdraw and want to like leave the house or like leave, leave the vicinity just so I could calm down and try to figure myself out. So we switched roles there for a little while as you became more emotionally intelligent and better able to like wade into the um, difficult emotions and deal with, with conflict before I was quite at that level. So, right. And then when you were asleep at night, sometimes I would want to throw a punch you. You would want to throw a punch. <laughs> <laughs> it's fair. It's fair. <laughs> you know, now that I think about it, some mornings I would wake up and I had kind of a sore throat. So <laughs> were you like punching me I in my sleep? I admit to nothing. I admit to nothing. <laughs> now, now, something to keep in mind, you know, it, it, when addressing the cycle and when wanting to get better and to improve and not be in the cycle so much uh, something to keep in mind is that this has been a pattern for years, if not decades, and therefore it is not something you just snap your fingers, flip the light switch, and then suddenly we're all better, right? There's a, there's a phrase which sounds really good, but is ultimately false, which is when you know better, you do better, right? Oh, it sounds so good and it sounds so nice, and yet it is false because these neurological connections in our brain, which I will sometimes call a, uh, emotional uh, muscle memory. I call right. them neural pathways and right. you call them emotional muscle memory. Right. Yeah. Because, because, because it's muscle memory. It's, it's what we're used to doing. It's acted. It's how I've always talked about or addressed things. And so it's important to, to, to give ourselves some grace and some flexibility when we're talking about growth and improvement. We have to be flexible. We have to allow ourselves to circle back is, is, is what I refer to it as. And, you know, imagine with me uh, a scenario where you're driving down the highway and there's a, a specific exit that you need to get off on. And we've all done this at one point or another in our lives where there's a specific exit we want to get off on and we miss it right? We, we, we miss it and we're like, oh crap, I didn't see it. Or I just was zoning out or, or something. And, and, and sometimes the reason we miss a specific exit is because we're used to, uh, getting off at maybe another exit. And, and so it's muscle memory. It's, it's, it's what I've always been used to doing. And because I'm used to getting off at, the, at this other exit, I miss the other one. Now, 
when we miss that exit, I'm willing to bet that most of the time we don't just pull off to the side of the road and scream and yell and and hit the ceiling or something, right? You know, uh, we, we, we probably like, what would you do? I'd get off at the next exit. I might scream and yell right. all the way to the next exit, right. but I would get off at the next exit. Right. And then at the next exit, we we, we either circle around, get back on the freeway and, and go back to the, that, that exit that we missed, or maybe we just take some side streets and, and find our way there that way. So this concept of circling back, I think, is an important one because we have to recognize that we are going to miss that exit. In other words we're going to fall into that cycle still. It's still going to happen. And that's why the goal of never getting into the cycle is the wrong goal to have here. We have to recognize that we're still going to get into that cycle from time to time. But the goal here is to catch ourselves sooner and sooner. Maybe we have an argument and it's the next day that we suddenly realize, oh crap, that's that cycle that we talked about or that Kevin talked about in our last session or, or something, right? If, if, we, if we can recognize that, if we can acknowledge that, guess what? That actually is progress because we're, we're recognizing it. And then maybe we have another argument and this time we, we catch ourselves maybe an hour or two later. And then we have another argument, you know, sometime after that, and we realize it kind of midway through, you know, and then eventually maybe we're catching ourselves right as we're getting into the cycle, but we slow down, we pull away, we cool off, and then we come back and and try to work through it. The goal is catch yourself sooner and sooner, right? Mm -hmm. If you miss that exit, you probably start to take mental notes. You're like, oh, shoot. Okay. The exit is right by that big target right there. And so the next time I see that target, I'll know the exit's coming up, right? Maybe you miss the exit one or two more times after that, but eventually, especially if this is an exit you need to get off, you know, on a regular basis, eventually it's going to become muscle memory and you're just going to be like a homing pigeon and you're not going to even think about it anymore. And you just, you just do it because that's what you've always done. Yeah. And that's how it's worked for us with working through this cycle as well is I remember times when we would catch ourselves after the cycle. And I remember times when we'd catch ourselves midway through the cycle. And it was usually you because you were working with this so often that you would say, wait, wait, stop. What triggered you? Help me understand. And I could almost like I could see you detach um, in in that RAIN acronym. You know, I use uh, non-attachment. I can't remember what the N is anymore right now, but you detach, you realize non-identified. Non-identified, yeah. Yeah. So I, I could almost watch you like step out and detach and look at the cycle in the middle. Mm-hmm. And that taught me to do that. Mm-hmm. And now we often catch ourselves right at the trigger. Yeah. I mean, it's really common for one of us to get triggered and be like, oh, what just happened there? Right. We don't even get into the cycle a lot of the time now. We stop it right at the trigger. Right. We, a lot of us have heard the phrase out of sight, out of mind. The opposite is true. Insight, in mind. Sometimes I will recommend people, you know, print out a copy of this this cycle, this diagram, put it up on the refrigerator, put it up on the bathroom mirror, put it someplace visible so you are reminded of it, so that you see it, and so that you can review either with yourself or, you know, with your partner, what is the part that I play in this? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or if you're catching it afterwards to go back and and assign the roles, like what was that feeling I was feeling? What was the story I was telling myself? How did my reaction trigger you? How Mm -hmm. are you experiencing that? Mm -hmm. Um, And by the way, do that when you're calm. So Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You want to try and obviously have that conversation, not when you're really heated and escalated. Your reptilian brain doesn't like conversations like that. Right. So... This has been fantastic. Is there anything else you want to say to kind of complete the episode? Not that I can think of. I hope that's helpful. Well, it's been a wonderful pleasure having you on the episode. I love that I get to live with you and we get to have these conversations all the time. I hope this has been really helpful for you guys. Um, So many of my clients, people I'm talking to on Instagram, people I'm talking to on the Facebook pages are, you know, talking about these kind of patterns, particularly, I mean, all of us have the patterns regardless, but particularly if one of you has deconstructed your faith and the other one is still in, these can be really, really helpful conversations for navigating those waters, especially. But, you know, any arguments around sexuality, any arguments around like how, you know, division of labor and other topics that we're going to be bringing up that do have to do with, um, religious transition, 
this we wanted to cover it early because you know we're coming up on the month of love but also because um, it informs all of our human interactions that have to do with our faith transitions what we just went over here it works with your spouse with your significant other your boyfriend or girlfriend your mom or dad these are all, I mean, this pattern is for any human interaction, and it's so important to know and understand um, so that we can get the healthy relationships that we long for. We all long for love and belonging. We all long for trust in our relationships. We all long to feel that soul connection with someone in our lives, and these are steps to start getting there. So I appreciate you sharing your knowledge Um, Not only with me for the last 20 years, but also with the listeners today. I know that that's going to be helpful. So if you guys want to have more discussions about this, um, we're going to be discussing these ideas in detail on my Facebook group. The link is in the show notes. We're going to be discussing it in detail on Instagram. So you can follow me at Emancipated Molly. If you want to print off that diagram that Kevin was talking about, follow that link to his website. You can print it off there, and um, you can follow me on Twitter, Reddit, um, and I even just got a TikTok account. We'll see where that goes. So my sister's trying to move me into the the next generation of social media. So we will we will see if we had that that way. But for right now. Follow me at any of those other links and we will talk again soon. Thanks so much for joining us today.